Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us tonight. And I am delighted to welcome all of you in joining me for a Vega Views conversation with Dr. Liz Spangenberg um, about designing for people, the value for user experience design. Um, I'd like to introduce Liz first. She's a passionate advocate for human-centered design and putting user need and needs and expectations at the center of everything uh, we design. She's also lead designer at IVC Health, TEDx speaker on human-centered design and UX design. Um, she holds a PhD in information design from the University of Pretoria, and she was involved in the development of a brand new postgraduate diploma in UX design that we are rolling out at the IIE Vega next year. Liz, we are very excited to have you join us uh, tonight and to listen to you. Very welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. So I'm going to kick off. I've got a couple of questions and uh, yeah, look forward to the conversation. So UX design is a fairly new field or at least in South Africa. So um, starting off, I'd like to ask you uh, for the benefit of uh, all our listeners and viewers, what is UX design and what's the difference between UX designers, experience designers and product designers? It can become quite confusing, I think. Yeah, I think we, we all get so overwhelmed with the amount of jargon that's used uh, in general, it can be very confusing when you hear all these different terms and you start wondering, but are they the same thing? Or are they different things? Um, so to get to answer the first part of your question, so experience design, user experience design, in its essence, is trying to look at how we create experiences for people, answers in the name. Um, the user part um, usually refers to some kind of digital interface that you're looking at and interacting with. So a cell phone, a um, computer screen, um, but this can also extend to things like ATMs, which also have screens. If you think about um, wayfinding in malls, where you also have this big screen that you're interacting with, all of those are user experiences. Now, that experience then can be translated to a whole bunch of other things. So if you think, for instance, um, about downloading an app, your experience of that app doesn't start when you actually open the app. Your experience of that app starts when you actually go to the Play Store or the Apple Store and go and download the app. So you see the images and the description that they have in there. So that's your first experience of that app, actually. So there's a whole much, bunch of things that are outside of just the actual, you know, website or app that you might think about. So it's a very broad field and it can be applied to a vast number of things. So user experience design, by definition, usually refers to designing for digital experiences. So like I said, any kind of sort of digital screen that you're designing for. Experience design, so dropping the user part. A lot of people, myself included, don't like the word user um, because it reduces the people we are designing for to a very abstract term. So it starts becoming kind of easy for people to say, oh, the users are doing things wrong or the users made this mistake. They're not users, they're people and we're designing for real people. So um, you'll hear me talking about human centered design as well. So there's a whole debate in the industry about user centered design, versus human centered design. It's similar but different. And there's a big move towards calling things human centered as opposed to user centered. But that's a whole other conversation. But dropping the user and just looking at experience design, it's usually more or less the same thing um, where you're designing experiences. It might be a little bit broader, so to include things like customer experience. So um, looking outside of the digital realm, but it can also just refer to uh, designing um, purely digital experiences. It depends. 
product designers, same thing where you're combining different parts. So you have user experience design and then user interface design. The experience usually refers to the way that you're structuring information, the way that people are going through an application or a website or going through the steps of something. So you're designing that experience and the interface is the way it looks. So that is your beautiful color gradients, your drop shadows and whether the button is rounded or not. All of those things are intertwined and affect one another, but they are slightly different fields. So if you're looking at product design, that usually includes a bit of user experience design, a little bit of uh, user interface design. However, that term is used completely different. Uh, if you look at Europe and in um, America, they use product design to mean UX design. So it's very regional, it's very specific. I've seen different companies in South Africa even use completely different terms for exactly the same thing. So if you hear all these different terms, try and clarify with the person you're that you're talking to what exactly they're talking about, because just because one person means something, it doesn't mean that another person understands it that way, um, because there is so much jargon and so many different ways all these different terms are being used. Uh, it's better to just ask, honestly, that people are often afraid of asking because they feel that might sound stupid. Um, I would argue that there's a bigger risk of, of coming across as stupid if you don't ask questions and you completely misunderstand. Um, I've done that before where I'll be the person in a meeting, put my hand up and say, I don't understand the acronym that you're using right now. Um, can you please explain it to me? Because otherwise you might, you might be slightly lost or might have a completely complete misconcep misconception, sorry, for the rest of the meeting that you're in. So a lot of jargon in the design world um, and a lot of the things overlap. Some of them have slightly different nuances and honestly, it depends who you're talking to. That's great. I've spoken like a true UX designer. <laughs> um, so then with there's so many apps and, and platforms out there and AI, AI and things like Canva. So why do businesses and software developers need UX designers? So, oh, that's a multi-layered question. Um, so I'll start with the end. Um, why? do businesses and developers and uh, business analysts, why do they actually need designers? Um, because we fulfill a very specific role, which is actually in between everything else. So if you look at software developers, their job tends to be, and I'm grossly generalizing here, but their job tends to focus on technical feasibility. So they create what is possible in the time frame that they have um using the tech stack that they have integrating with whatever systems that they need so they focus on the technology they want to build cool stuff which is amazing then you have the business side and they want to create products that are profitable so you need to make sure that this thing is business viable and then on the other hand you have uh, your users so the people actually using your product so your customers your consumers your members, whatever they might be. And they they want something they want, something they can use, something that will be valuable to them. And very often you'll find that these three sectors, so what people want, what the business wants, and what the software devs want to or can do, might not necessarily all speak to one another. And what ends up happening is if you have something that the business wants and is going to make them a lot of money, and you have something that the devs can build and you just combine those two, great. You might end up with a product that no one wants. So you have a great product, but there's no market demand for it. On the other hand, if you have something that the devs can build and that people really want, but there's no money in it, the business isn't gonna make money, no one's gonna build that because there's no business sense in it. So designers tend to occupy that space in the middle. So we often become mediators and you'll often see designers sort of 
stretching across various parts of the business and involved in lots of different meetings where sometimes to other people it might not make sense why they're in all those meetings. But I often find myself in meetings that are highly technical or highly business related, but it's because I bring unique insights from the other teams. So I try and make sure that everyone's on the same page, that we're building something that is going to make the business money because that's why any business is in business. They want to and need to make money. Um, something that people want. So I'm an advocate for what people want um, as well as what is going to benefit them. And then I also try and navigate, you know, what can the devs build? Because it doesn't have, we have this help, we have this fantastic idea, but, you know, technology for that's only going to exist in 2050. So designers beyond designing the actual artifact so beyond designing the actual button and you know what wording should go onto which button people often reduce design to that to just the way it looks or just the information on the screen we fulfill a much broader role where we bring these different parts together and we help to figure out where that golden thread is to actually make things happen so that's why you need designers, because we have a finger in every pie and we bring all the different parts together. And then we take that and we listen to what the business wants and needs. And we translate those things into actual designs that people want uh, through research. And we find out, but OK, this is what the business wants. We can create quick prototypes, go and talk to people. How would you interact with this? see if the devs can build it, and then we go from there without ever having to code a single thing. So that's the last part of your question answered. And then before that, you asked, you know, there are so many tools available nowadays. Um, people can use Canva. Figma just brought out a really interesting tool where you can create little sticky notes and just write what you think your user flow should be, and then click Generate Interface. Uh, you get different tools like, um, I think it's called Galileo AI, where you can also just enter uh, what you want a screen to be and you click generate and it makes this beautiful AI um, interface for you. I'm sure those things exist. Um, and you can go, um, skip the designer and just go and do that yourself. But there's always risks. And the risk is that, um, Designers also don't just type in things and then create things. We interpret and we research. So we go and find out, is this viable? We go and speak to people and actually, you know, find out, is this going to work? Is this going to work the way that you think? So many times we've come up with ideas and then we go and speak to people. Um, and then we find out, oh, this, the way we thought something was going to work is not how people actually want or need it to work, um, which is absolutely vital. So we try, we, we take those ideas that you have and make sure that all these different considerations are taken into account. There's also another part of it, which is that designers work on best practice. So Maybe you've heard of Google's material guidelines, um, Apple's human interface guidelines. If you use an Android phone or an iPhone, you'll have seen that most of your apps tend to follow the same kinds of patterns. They have the back buttons in the same spaces. Now, this is especially true for Apple because they're a lot stricter with this in the App Store. Um, they have the back buttons in the same place. Some of the apps maybe look and function the same. And this is because they have very specific guidelines in terms of how people use things and their software and how people want to use things. They've done a lot of research into this. So by following those established patterns, we can make sure that people are going to understand. And this might sound obvious, but it, it might be something as simple as making sure a button looks like a button. Because we've been trained what buttons look like, right? They are either pull box shapes or they maybe they're square but they usually have a solid color in the background. You might have a button that's a hyperlink at night blue with a line underneath it. We've been trained that these things are buttons and we know that they're buttons. So but with that cognitive recall, you know that if I design something that looks like that, 
someone's going to know that this is a button and click on it. But if I come up with something completely wildly different that no one has ever seen, and yes, you get some apps that do that, or create something completely brand new and different. Sometimes it works because it's new and innovative. Majority of the times it fails spectacularly because people don't want to work to figure out how to use your app or your website. People don't want to think about it. They want to do the thing. So if you go to an online shop, for instance, and you're buying a dress, you don't want to sit there and think, oh, that's the prettiest button with the nicest drop shadow I've ever seen. You want to buy the dress. So you don't want to sit and think and deliberate, where should I click in order to get the right size in order to buy this dress? You just want to do the thing. The best user experience is one you never have to think about. You just do the thing and get to the end and it's over. That's the best user experience. It's not the one where you stop and go. Because, I mean, think to yourself, how often have you used an app or used a website and then afterwards thought to yourself, wow, that was a really great experience. It might be a great experience because of how easy it was. But you'll really think, hmm, the way that they broke this information up into five different pages where, um, you know, the, the structure of it was really well done. No one does that. If it was really well done, you wouldn't even have noticed it. Well, that's the way it should be, at least. And a good designer will help you get there. And that is what artificial intelligence and generative models can't do yet, at least at this stage. They're a great tool. Um, and they can give you fantastic ideas. Um, and they can help you brainstorm. So the way that I use artificial intelligence and uh, things like ChatGPT in my workflow if I'm going to do interviews with people and I need to interview a couple of stakeholders to get some insights into the redesign of the system that I'm doing, I'll ask the, um, the large language model, I need to interview this person to, um, uh, for this system that we're changing, help me generate questions that I can ask. So I've already come up with a couple of questions and I'll give it the questions that I've come up with as well and ask it to help me generate similar questions. And maybe it's uh, because it has access to a lot of information that I don't, um, it can give me ideas for other idea uh, questions. And I look at it and I go, oh wait, I didn't think about that. That's a great idea. I should include that as well. So it helps you to um, expand your horizon because as a designer, I think that's also one of the first things that you'll probably hear and be taught as a user experience designer is you are not the person that you're designing for. The vast majority of the time, whatever you're designing, you are not the target market. So the vast majority of the time, you're designing for someone completely different. Um, so you need to put yourself into their shoes and try and think differently, which can be hard. So using something like a generative AI um, to help you come up with ideas. Fantastic idea, it's a tool to be used, but be very careful of thinking, oh, this thing is the be all and end all. Um, a few, quite a few years ago, there was a, I can't remember the name now, there was a startup company who came up with this idea that you could just type in what you want your website to be and this thing will build it for you. And they did that. And the websites were absolutely horrific. Some of them are still live. Um, I'll see if I can find a link um, to the, the case study and uh, post it. But it, it, it is shockingly bad. And it just goes to show that just because something can generate something for you, it doesn't mean it's going to be worth anything or valuable in any way. And if you don't have a designer with the background of using design principles, using typography, using visual hierarchy for layouts in order to guide users through a uh, system, you might end up with issues because you yourself might not be able to identify where the problems are. So design, it's a very big debate about democratizing design. Yes, anyone can design anything. Whether it's going to be a good design is a different conversation. 
and design in that sense it's not subjective because we're not talking about is it pretty or not because we're not creating art it's a matter of if i design this page am i going to convert the people who look at this page into customers and there are actionable tangible research paper or there is actionable research that you can read um, that will guide you in terms of how to do that and these are actual practical um, objective ways to do that which is not is it a pretty button or not it's about how you structure the information it's about how you guide people through the process and that is what makes design complicated not impossible but just because you can use canva it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to create a successful design i hope that answers I'm so, your question yeah it does i'm so glad you touched on so many things because the the next question i wanted to ask you was what knowledge and skills do you need to be a ux designer i think you already touched on on quite a few of them um but yeah is there anything else that you'd like that that you can think of that that um designers knowledge and skills that designers need i'd say the the most important thing is um being curious and asking why um it's not good enough to just know people aren't clicking on the button you need to ask why are people not clicking on the button so to give you an example we had a client many years ago and part of their business was they had a form on their homepage and they wanted people to fill in the form and submit it and then they could call people back um, so it's lead generation um, tool sorry and people weren't filling in the form and people weren't clicking submit so the clients said okay what we're going to do is we're going to make the button bright orange and we're going to make it flash so using those nice you know digital platform that we have we're going to make it flash and told them okay um i guess we can do that um client was very adamant they're like just people aren't the people can't see the button they're not filling in the but uh, the form make it orange make it flash to absolutely no one's surprise that didn't change a single thing because the problem was not that people couldn't find the button. The problem was that people don't want to be phoned. Um, so there was an inherent misunderstanding in terms of um, the way that people wanted to interact with their business. So by asking why and getting to the core of the, um, the, the issue, we were then able to design a better experience for them where you know, we could integrate a, a live chat on the website. So people were very happy to do that. I don't know about you, but I hate phone calls. I hate making phone calls. I hate receiving phone calls. They give me anxiety. So I want to chat to someone either by email or via chat. Um, it just makes it so much easier because it gives you a moment to just collect your thoughts before you say something. Um, so that inquisitiveness and I, I always tell junior designers this when they ask you know what skills uh, back when I was a hiring manager you know and I was interviewing people they'd ask me what skills do you look for in a designer and honestly it's inquisitiveness it's never being satisfied with the surface level answer you need to keep asking why until you get to the core of something and that's going to help you so much so being inquisitive um, being curious, uh, patient, it, working with people, working with people you're interviewing, whether it's customers or clients, um, it's not always easy because people are complex, difficult beings. They're not, not predictable. Someone might do one thing one day and a completely different thing the next day. And people are going to use your app or your website in complex, complete ways you never expected they're going to break things in ways you never expected and you need to learn to live with that ambiguity and accept that okay i need to take a deep breath it's not that they're doing something wrong it's that something's wrong in my design that they can't get it right so it's that mind shift change that i'm not going to blame them and say they're doing things wrong so they the the users thing comes in again 
because it's very easy to say, oh, the users are getting it wrong. The users can't find it. No, you design something in a way that they can't interact with it. So you need to change that thinking. So yeah, there, there's a lot of different skills. And honestly, majority of it has nothing to do with the tools that you're using. Um, tools can be taught. So whether you're using, um, uh, what's it called, XD, or whether you're using Figma, or whether you're using um, Sketch, whether you're using Balsamic or whatever for prototyping in Vision, it doesn't matter because all of those things are tools and they're skills that you can learn. And when designers should not be defined by the tools that they know. Tools are useful, of course, but um, the way that you think is far more powerful and being able to keep asking questions and figuring out, but what is it that we really need and that we really need to change? That's absolutely invaluable. And the other thing that I also say is um, that's absolutely invaluable to a designer is make very good friends with your software developers. I've heard some horror stories about people uh, designing things and then sending it to the devs and never speaking to them again. And that's just simply not how it works because the thing that we design, it's not art. You can't just make the most amazing, beautiful thing and then send it to the devs and say, cool, now it's your problem. Because we work, in, we live and work in an imperfect world where we have legacy systems that we need to integrate with that have certain restrictions. Um, one place I worked at, we were working with systems that were I think 40, 50 years old, because that's how old the company were, was. And they had certain database restrictions. There were certain fields we simply could not ask people that we had to, and had to store in different databases. And we had to ask the questions on different pages because of the way the databases were structured. And this is not something that the devs did wrong. It's simply a restriction that they had to work with, and we had to work with them to solve that. So it's a matter of compromising, again, being patient and figuring out how to solve this together. So it's never a matter of designers versus devs because some people would for, will frame it that way, but it really isn't. It's team effort to figure out how can we get the best user experience together. I've worked with some amazing developers who I would go to them with a the design and ask them what they thought and they'd say, mm, okay, Actually, they have this really cool piece of tech that can do X, Y, and Z that I didn't even know existed and improved the user experience a hundred times. So, well, not that it can actually be measured that much, but um, I work, so if you work with really great people who are willing to come to the table and help you with those ideas, it's you can get a really amazing collaborative team effort going where you build each other up and your experience enhances what the other person knows. So here are, and that's a question that I was actually also wanting to ask, but here are three similar questions from our audience. Um, Farrell's asked, how do you deal with conflicting interests between, between what the business objectives are and what's, you, what's actually best for the user? And then uh, Simon asked, Liz, how do you scientifically explain to a business stakeholder why a design is a good design without it being a conversation about feelings or looks? And then Anka asked, how do you guide clients to continue, continuously do user testing with the actual users? So I think all the same along the same vein and all speaking back to this idea of working together, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I'm going to need you to remind me of the, the other questions, but I'll start with the first one. Um, in terms of conflicting interests, that's a very hard one. And you'll find that time and time again, um, you might come up with what you think is the ideal user journey for um, your clients and your customers and then the business will come back and say actually we want it slightly differently so what i found is that um and okay it, it ties into the second and third question so first of all try and advise them why you designed it the way you did 
So often it's a matter of miscommunication. People don't realize that, you know, you thought through this quite in depth. So if you made three or four different versions, go back and show them, look, I tried three or four different things. Um, one of the ones that you asked for is in here, or if you hadn't designed the one that they asked for, do that, and then explain to them why you feel that yours works better. And again, like you said, not according to feelings, but according to actual empirical research, which is where the second one comes in, user testing. So if you're at an impasse with your business stakeholders and they want you to do something in a specific way, you think that it would be better in a different way. The easiest way to resolve that conflict without it devolving into opinions and feelings is to actually go and ask the people who will be using this solution. So go and ask the users, schedule user usability testing, and then um, do an A-B test where you go through the first design and then you go through the second design, do it in different orders so that the, the research isn't biased in that sense. Um, and try and find out, but which one are people reacting to better in the sense that they actually get to what you want them to do. So again, the shopping example, if you want them to buy something, you know, ask them, okay, what does this image um, intrigue you to want to buy this or this video or would the uh, price higher up or lower down uh, entice you to um, buy this product? Why or why not? And then once you have that research in terms of what uh, people are actually saying, you go back to the business and then you can say, hey, so according to the research that we did, people would prefer option A or option B for the following reasons, the following practical reasons why this is a better structure. Sometimes it's your design, sometimes it's not. Most of the times it's a combination of the two and very often in ways that you didn't expect them to be combined. So it might be, you know, a little bit of A, a little bit of B, and then you see how you can combine them. The reality is sometimes you will have stakeholders who say, okay, that's nice. I don't care. Build it my way. And at that point, quite frankly, you have done your due diligence because you are there in the role as a design advisor and you are there to advise the business on what the best user experience would be. So you have done your duty to tell them that I think this would be the best user experience based on this research. Users would also agree that this is what they would like, but business would like to go with a different option. In the end, it's their business. They're paying for this. So it's a matter of choosing your battles. So look at it in a matter of, is it going to be the end of the world if the button is on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? No, do what the business wants. And if in, you launch it and in a week or a month later, you find hmm, things are not converting, sales are not converting as well as we would like, then go to them and do not tell them, hey, I was right, that will never end well, but go to them and say, hey, we have other options that we can try. How about we try a different version? So the easiest way to, to get past that short answer, usability testing, and then you go back to them. If they don't want to listen, then you do what they tell you to. However, if you're dealing with a situation where you feel there's an ethical conflict or you notice that the business is maybe trying to implement dark patterns, trying to, you know, auto opt people into something that they don't realize or hidden fees, things like that. I would strongly recommend that you fight a bit harder on those points because you are in the end, the advocate for the people. So if you know your company's trying to do something a little bit dodgy, try and convince them why it's a bad idea. And again, bring it back to a business uh, language that they can understand. So. For instance, the reputation to the brand, if people realize what they're doing, that is a massive risk in this day and age. Um, 
one person goes on Twitter and say, hey, this company scammed me. They billed me for a year when they made it sound like it was on, I was only going to be billed for a week. For instance, you can kill a brand's reputation very quickly. So try and remind them that they have a responsibility to be ethical and to not introduce dark patterns and remind them that it will be bad for business, very frankly, because people don't stand for that anymore. They'll go on Hello Peter, they'll go on Twitter, and yes, I will keep calling it Twitter. Um, they'll go on LinkedIn and they're going to expose whatever the company's doing and no one will want to do business with them. So it, it is proven that it is genuinely in a company's best interest to actually be ethical and to actually not try and pull the wool over people's eyes. Be transparent and that actually gets you a lot of respect. And I think that is why what I also always tell our students, you know, that is where your knowledge as a designer of, of, of the principles and the theories around design comes in. Because if you if you can leverage those when trying to convince your, your client, uh, your arguments are so much stronger. Liz, another Definitely. question. Um, uh, how do you stay updated on UX trends and best practices with and, and to apl uh, apply them without uh, losing sight of human-centered design and putting humans or people first? Yeah, so I follow a lot of designers on LinkedIn. I probably spend way more time on LinkedIn than I should. But I follow a lot of designers on LinkedIn, um, thought leaders, um, not necessarily even people from giant companies, just I've found some fascinating people and how I found those people to follow who post very interesting content is through conferences. So sadly, there are very few uh, design conferences in South Africa. There used to be, I think, two. There is now one. Um, uh, UX South Africa, I think it's happening next week or the week after that in Johannesburg. Um, all the other ones that I know of yeah, have closed down, but you find some really interesting people and really interesting talks um, at those at that conference and also international conferences. Um, so I've been lucky enough to um, attend one international one in person because I happened to be on holiday and added that on to the end of my trip. Um, and then during COVID, I also attended a lot of international conferences online, which was fascinating. Um, it, it just opens your world to, you know, how people do things in the rest of the world. Um, and then also meetups. Um, there are quite a few South African meetups, um, both virtually and in person. Um, so wherever you're based, uh, Johannesburg, Cape Town, or else, uh, other places, there, there are meetups around. Um, definitely have a lookout for those, and they're definitely worthwhile to attend and to meet uh, like minded people, have discussions about design, about ethics, about product design, about um, complaining about stakeholders, <laughs> um, venting about uh, developers, um, whatever it might be that is frustrating you at the moment. I can promise you, you're not the only one. Um, I saw a comment uh, just pop up, uh, ladies at UX, um, they're great. Uh, you also have She Can Do. Um, the Interaction Design Foundation has uh, branches in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. Um, I can't think of all the different ones right now, but there are quite a few and they're, they're really great for, for meeting people. I've met some amazing people through that. Um, yeah, so keep an eye out for that. Um, so through that, you'll then find out about new things that are happening and people share articles about things that they hear and things that they see. Um, and you can keep an eye and uh, uh, a finger on the pulse of sort of what's happening in, in the design industry, both in South Africa and internationally. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see sort of the trends come through. So, I mean, Two years ago about, I think there was that massive trend towards um, the, what was it called, the glass skeuomorphism, um, where everything was, you know, slightly see-through and slightly elevated. Um, and it was really pretty and very nice and impossible for the devs to implement and they hated it. 
and also really bad for accessibility. Um, so it's really interesting to see the trends come through and then also the critiques that come through. So I'd say at the moment, some of the, I don't want to call them trends because it goes much deeper than that. But the things that are becoming more prominent that makes me excited is people becoming more aware of sustainable design um, as well as ethical design um, and accessibility as well. So it, like I said, I don't want to call it a trend because these are fundamental things that we as designers should be aware of. But I see more and more people talking about it, more and more people um, uh, incorporating these things into their designs. And that makes me incredibly happy because being more accessible with our designs, designing for people who are differently abled um, or who have uh, neurodivergent uh, brains, it makes it more accessible for everyone. Uh, ethical design, I did my master's on ethics. Um, so also something I'm super passionate about. And I think that's really important is looking at how we design and um, not using our design skills for evil, quite frankly, because design can very easily be used to manipulate and we shouldn't do that. Um, so be wary of the way that you use your power, if I can call it that. Yeah, as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, I <laughs> just referring back to some of the organizations that you were talking about, like She Can Do or Ladies That UX. Um, what challenges have you faced as a woman in a mostly male dominated tech field and how have you navigated them? It's been interesting. Um, I started my career in advertising, which is even more heavily male dominated, I'd almost say, um, especially on the higher levels. Um, almost all of the senior people in advertising are men. Um, and in UX as well, um, uh, Lizette and I were having this conversation that even in UX, a lot of the, the senior people are men. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with some absolutely amazing designers. And the frustrating thing is, I, I don't think I've ever really had a female senior mentor um, just because there they are so few. Um, but I think one of the important things is we need to remember as women to uplift each other. I've worked with some women who wanted to drag me down. Um, I remember as a junior, someone more senior than me telling me like, oh, I should be lucky to be included in things because at her age, she wasn't. And it was literally a briefing session. And I remember thinking, but I don't understand. How do you expect me to do my job if I'm not allowed to be in the briefing session? Do you want me to work on second or third hand information and probably get it wrong because we're playing broken telephone? And she said, yes, because that's how she had to do it. So be very wary of the, the mindset that just because you maybe had it hard, everyone, the other people who come after you should suffer too. That's not how it works. We need to uplift each other and we need to help each other. Um, there's no reason not to. We're not competing with each other for jobs or for opportunities. You're, you're competing with yourself. So the best person for that role will get that role. So don't try and break other people down in order to uplift yourself. It doesn't make you look good. I've seen people do that and it always backfires. So honestly, as a woman in tech has been less challenging than my age in tech. Um, I think I've experienced more ageism than I did sexism. Um, when I was more junior, so many times I was excluded from conversations and not allowed to take part in things and people would make disparaging things saying like, oh, you know quite a lot for your age. I'm like, yes, because I know what I'm doing. Um, and it's really frustrating to be underestimated or people telling you, oh, but you're just a junior, what would you know? And uh, that's absolute nonsense. Um, juniors bring a wealth of knowledge to the table. They're not cynical. They're not jaded. They're not uh, 
they haven't learned b bad habits, uh, which is fantastic. And they bring new thoughts and new ideas. Um, so I love working with juniors and it makes me super excited to always go to the different um, design schools and to see um, the, the portfolio showcases and see what the, the new generation is bringing because it's completely different, wildly different ideas and different ways of thinking. So don't let anyone ever put you down just because you're younger. Um, listen if they want to do something differently and again, find out why, because it might be that they have many years of experience. So they've tried it your way and it failed miserably. Therefore, they want to do it in a different way. But find out, ask. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's just important to, to be supportive of all the other people um, who are your gender, your sex, um, and yeah, uplift each other. It's very important. So what advice would you give to those looking to transition into a career in UX design? It makes me very excited to see how many people are moving into UX from other industries. I've seen a lot of people from architecture, from um, uh, psychology, um, marketing. Um, and I think those people bring very unique skills because they're coming from a different background where they look at the world slightly differently. Um, than say someone who just studied pure design. And I say this as someone who studied pure design, um, they, they bring a different point of view. So changing careers after having studied something different or um, having worked in a different field, it can be pretty daunting to start over as a junior, but you'll probably advance in your career quite a bit faster because you've already learned some of the softer skills like um, collaborating with your team, vocalizing what you mean in meetings, um, which I'm not doing very well right now, articulating your words um, and being able to express your thoughts um, and also finding that way to, you know, work harmoniously in your team. So those softer skills that take us a while to develop and it's, it's not necessarily something you can teach someone in a course, you can give them pointers, but sometimes you need a bit of lived experience. So just be patient with yourself and with your team members um, and make sure that you're up to date with the latest um, you know, technology that is happening, know what's happening in the world of AI. Don't uh, base your career on it, um, but know what's happening with those tools and use them when necessary. Um, what other tips? <laughs> I'd say just make sure that um, yeah you you understand how uh, different design techniques work, how different design processes work, and find out you know how do software development processes work. So something that I think one of the big gaps that we have uh, between what people learn um, in uh, design schools and the industry is the software development process and where design fits into that. So agile methodologies, scrum methodologies. I only learned about this when I actually started working and it was very overwhelming to suddenly learn that there were scrums and water bearers and sprints and all the sports methodology. And I'm like, I'm trying to do design while well, there's sports wording everywhere. So if you don't know what any of those words mean, Google agile methodologies or agile software development methodologies. It's just a way of working and familiarize yourself with that kind of idea. And that will also give you a leg up and help you to just understand where design fits into the bigger software development cycle, because it's, it's not a standalone thing. Like I've said many times, design fits in everywhere and it helps to understand, but where do you fit into the bigger picture? So I'm so excited because it seems that a lot of those things we cover in our new postgraduate diploma, which is also specifically designed for people that want to transition um, from other careers or from, from um, other undergraduate studies. So if anybody is interested, you can uh, look, I posted the link to the qualification in the chat. 
Liz, I'm going to uh, ask a couple or throw open uh, or repeat a couple of questions that came from the audience. So Simon asks, how do South African UX designers shape up on the global stage? I'd say very well, to be honest. Um, I think what makes us different is honestly our, our cultural context. Um, as South Africans, I think we have a very unique ability to empathize with people because we're used to such a multicultural country. You know, I think we have 13 official languages at the, at the moment. Um, we have many different cultures. We have many expats and we're naturally as as we grow up we learn about different cultures and we understand that my lived experience is not your lived experience and it never can be we're not a homogenous society we we have lots of different things happening and we all know and respect that um and i think that respect translates into empathy and knowing that other people have different experiences and when you do have a and I'm generalizing, but if you have a relatively homogenous society, so America, for instance, again, grossly generalizing, I know there are lots of cultures in America, but for the most part, you often see, you know, white Americans and they have a specific kind of culture. And for them, it might be a lot more difficult to empathize with other people when their entire community and everyone they interact with is of the same culture and of the same ethnicity. And I think we kind of have a superpower in that sense that we can put ourselves in other people's shoes or at the very least acknowledge that I don't know what's happening in someone else's shoes. So I definitely think that we have a, a superpower in that sense. In terms of technical capability, we have all of the latest tech um, and we work with all of the latest techniques and design thinking processes that everyone else internationally does. I think we do well at adapting it to a South African context. Um, yeah, so no, I, I think South African designers are absolutely world class. I'm sure you've heard of a lot of designers moving to the Netherlands or to Germany. I personally know a lot of people who have immigrated to a lot of different countries and they do so quite easily because South African designers are very in demand because we speak very good English and we have a very good work ethic. So, yeah, like I said, I know a lot of people who have immigrated because South Africans are in demand. So we shape up pretty well on the world stage, I'd say. Sadly, I know a couple as well. We lose some of our lecturers that way. <laughs> um, are there any, Namsla asked, are there any specific short courses that I could start off with um, if I want to look to move into UX? Ooh, it's been a while since I've looked at um, the different design courses available. But in terms of short courses, and I think that you might know this a bit better considering that you are in the education space but i do know that um university of cape town has a, a short course i think that's six weeks could be wrong yeah. nine weeks um, yeah i think it's about six there's a couple of short courses that i know of i am usually a bit skeptical because uh, uh, for me they focus on 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 specific tools and methods so uh, it doesn't necessarily give you that principled understanding of why we are doing what we're doing or you know why you should do one thing in a specific context rather than a, than another thing so i think they they're a, a useful starting point but yeah i'm i'm always a bit skeptical because they are so very skills and tools focused and without really giving you a good understanding of the the why behind it and i i think you've so eloquently um explained it tonight a crucial part of UX design, I think, is uh, understanding the why and understanding the people and the thinking and and those those soft skills and those deeper things that the tools and methods aren't going to to equip you with. No, definitely um, true. Um, no, um, there, there's, there's just not enough time in a, in a short course to really 
cover everything but I mean you could study design for 10 years and still not know everything I mean I've been working for 14 years now I definitely don't know everything and I never will um, there's just too much to know so you're going to keep learning and the important thing is to start somewhere so um, you can also have a look at the Interaction Design Foundation um, they they courses tend to be very focused so you'll maybe do a course on gestalt principles or a course on usability testing um, i think they do have some intro ones as well they're all online and sort of in your own time um, but they're also very well done and they do work with um, a lot of industry leaders to create those um, courses like don norman he was one of the the founders if you don't know don norman look him up he's the father grandfather of ux design brilliant man um yes go and look at some of his talks uh, you'll learn a lot i love listening to his stuff i agree he really is someone to follow i think that more or less brings us to the end of our time so i'd really like to thank you i think it was very insightful um, I'd love to have more conversations at a later point. I, th I think there's a lot we agree on. Um, for everyone here tonight, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've also found it insightful and useful. And then uh, if there's anyone that, that's interested, as I said at the start, this was just one of our Vega Views conversations. Please join us again next week when Michelle O'Hara, um, our Deputy Dean of Brand Communication, will have a conversation with Bronwyn Williams about where are we headed? The imperative for futures thinking for building brands. Um, I will post the, the link to register for that talk in the chat. But on that note, Liz, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experience. It was really interesting and exciting listening to you. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've posted my LinkedIn um, on my profile, just Lizette Spanberg, you can go and find me. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to message me. I love chatting about design or uh, anything else in that uh, area. So feel free to message me. Um, yeah, I hope you all have learned something or at least not been horribly bored fact stuck out this whole time tells me that uh, hopefully we did something right. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I always love chatting about design. Thanks so much. Have a lovely evening, everyone, and goodbye.